Welcome to Flux Bug Scrub number nine. Um, let's get started. Uh, so we haven't decided where we're going to focus today. I have uh, one volunteer with me. Hello, Josis. Hello. And um, Josis, do you have anywhere you'd like to focus um, today or? Well, since maybe uh, I will customize sections of, of issues to help me get more familiar with customize. Yep, definitely. Um, so in our issue spreads spreadsheet for those who are joining us on the video, we've added a new feature today. We have discussions as well. Uh, so. We're going to keep the flux two issues in the list here and also customize related issues. I think that makes sense uh, because there can be customized discussion in the discussions, which are all under flux two. Um, and it can be under customized controller. Uh, I think that's probably about where we would find them. So. So that narrows it down quite a bit, um, but we still have a lot here. I'm not sure if we want to try a range to narrow it down some more. Let's do like three to five here. There, looks like we have mostly a reasonable list here now. Um, do you want to drive, by the way? Um, no, I'd like to, to follow your direction. OK. I pulled this one up earlier. I don't think it's in the range, but um, let's just look at this one first here. Uh, so we have this feature depends on. Are you familiar with that at all? Um, no, no, I'm not. Uh, also, can you? Uh, yes, um, yeah, can you introduce that? Yeah. Uh, so here's here's a pretty good um, example. Um, the feature is depends on, and it's a spec item, a spec field in. Um, both Helm release and customization. Um, and the way that it works is you specify a name and namespace. So this is a cross namespace resource reference. Um, and it refers to an object of the same type. So the context around this issue is um, Helm releases can depend on other Helm releases. Customizations can depend on other customizations. What does it mean when they depend on? It means that um, if customization B depends on A, then A must be ready uh, before B will begin to sync. So if you've added health checks to your customization, then uh, it will wait for those things to become ready before it marks itself as ready. Um, if you're using Helm release, then they already have their own built-in health checks. Um, so they have similar behavior. Uh, and the, the pain point here is that a Helm release and a customization cannot depend on each other, nor can they depend on other non-flux resources. Um, so there's a nice workaround that you can use that winds up having more customizations and uh, it's not really the best solution. And I think that this has come up enough times that the maintainers have acknowledged that we really would like for it to be possible to depend on across resource kinds. Uh, but depending from one flux resource to another is one thing and depending on, I'm not sure what we can do with this here. So uh, one thing we could do is mark as an answer since this is a pretty old discussion. 
And that way, at least it will be uh, pegged as the um, selected answer. Uh, but did you get a de decent overview of this feature? Yeah, but yeah, as, as much as I understand how that works, it, it, it's clear. Okay, case status is the standard that um, underpins all of this. And I don't know much about case status other than it's a standard across Kubernetes at large and any resource kind can fulfill the case status requirements to uh, become observable in that way. Uh, so it, it makes sense for people to ask that, hey, can I just depend on arbitrary resources for when they become ready, uh, but it's not currently supported. How do you add a build step to the GitOps flow? Hmm. Do you get all that? Um, I, I do get all that, but I don't know what, for example, rancher, what flow, what what fleet, what flow fleet has, and you know I don't understand some of the things he's talking about. So, yeah, neither do I. Um, but generally, what I can say is that. Um, Building is a CI responsibility and Flux is a CD tool. And it's opinionated in a way that we would really like for CI and CD to be totally separated. Uh, so I'm not sure how to answer this one either, um, but it is pretty old and we can mark the answer at least. Okay, yeah. So sort of the progression that people take when they learn how to use Flux for the first time um, is usually first they figure out how to put their manifests in the Git repo and get Flux to apply them to the cluster. And then they figure out that they can use Flux to select the latest image. And most people love this feature so much that they want it to do everything. Um, and then we have to reel them back in and get them uh, back on board with doing certain things in CI that make more sense to do in CI. Like if you have a bundle of images, then if they need to be released in a coordinated way, Flux's image automation is not for you because it will release them one at a time as they become ready and they get discovered by yeah. the automation. So that's, you probably want like- I remember from uh, us talking about image automation so you probably want to use a Helm release automation or something else. Um, there are a couple of features still, but um, that's that's good. Okay. Okay. Validation error. No objects passed to apply. I have seen this one before as well. Although I'm not sure I've seen this exact discussion before. Um, it would be good to link it back to, I'm going to pull up a, here another window here and see if I can find discussion to link it to.
Well, I can't find an existing issue uh, report, but. person has written in a long and winding question. I'm not sure where their actual question is. What I want to tell them based on the subject is that the customization that doesn't have any resources in it will be invalid because Flex assumes it's an error to not have any resources to apply. I'm not sure that's actually the question that they asked. Oh, okay, okay. So they. But the only way the object request to describe by manifest is to remove customized objects. Object. Options to remove apps. Removing manifest from the bucket. So do you see the use case, what they're trying to do? Um, so that I have coherently, I think they said that they have a, they have a single manifest in, uh, in the bucket and they're trying to delete the customization to delete everything. Is that right? They, they have customizations that are managed by admins. And so the devs are not able to delete them. Right, okay. Um, but the devs would like to be able to hollow them out. Um, uh, I think I'm just gonna go with a short and sweet reply that it makes sense to me, but it's not currently supported in the way that they... I imagined and the devs will have to leave at least one source in the deflated customization git repo maps such as a config map as otherwise the okay well that makes sense you can't create and update a resource in kubernetes to be invalid right correct and for the for, for this person to be able to accomplish that, that's what they would need. You can't do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to still understand the garbage collection uh, comment in the italics there, the hard part to the code. <coughs> Yeah, okay, so it says here, this is from the documentation, I guess. I don't know if there's anything else we can add here. How, how I understand it, like st still being a noob, is that uh, this this user deleted deleted the manifest from the from the Git bucket and expected that this would leave customization to delete all the customized controller to delete all the all the objects that were created, right? Yes. That is what they expected. And that's a very reasonable expectation. Um, so it's not that it makes the customization resource invalid. Uh, the, the resource is valid. It can still be applied. Um, it doesn't actually need to change. It's the content in the Git repository that 
is no longer valid. So the next time the customization tries to reconcile, it fails. And part of reconciling is a pre-validation step. So it fails there. So it never actually deletes anything. Okay. Ah, okay. That's, that's great. Yeah. Cool. Does that make sense? Good. Yeah. So that if, if it didn't, it's so just the matter if the controller fails earlier and it doesn't, doesn't get to reconcile to the stage where those objects are deleted, right? Yeah. Um, so it shouldn't, shouldn't it, like, if those objects depend on the customization, shouldn't it delete those objects first? I guess not because it can't, it can't commit in, it can't commit in. Right. It's based yeah. on Git. So it, it wants to do things atomically. So if it finds a commit that isn't valid, it doesn't want to apply any part of that commit. Makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was looking for uh, the other option that they have is to disable validation, which would work, I think, maybe, but I don't really want to suggest it without testing that because um, I'm not 100% sure it would work. So there's this validation field for a good example. Well, there aren't really any good examples here in the docs. Anyway, there's three values you can set it to, and two of them do validation. And then I'm not 100% sure about the difference between a uh, server and a local apply. Um, but I understand that we will be doing things with server side apply soon. So. Uh, I think I think the server side apply has some neat opportunities for validation that you don't have without the server side, like waiting until things come up and they're ready before you report success. Okay. All right, so let's move on. How to reference secrets from a different namespace in the customization. I think I remember one of the bug scrubs this was talked about before secrets across namespace or elsewhere it's an, it's an issue some questions from my mind who's where's the secret reference here how to reference secrets from a different namespace it's 8 30 a.m there's one entry today. At noon, you have six CLI bi weekly meetings. It's time to start your work day. Have a great day. Thanks, Google. Yeah. I think that's the answer. Give it an update. So how's your day going? Oh, it's going okay. I've been trying to replicate a CSS problem for like a day and a half now. Not, you know, the whole time, but just keep going at it. And I'm giving up on that. It's, it's not fun when you can't, you can't reproduce a CSS or you don't understand why layout is not working. I think I'm just going to rebuild the layout. You know what we should do is add these back in. I don't know. Yeah, these ones, you know, like uh, I'm familiar with them, so. All right, we don't need to then. 
Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there that needs to be done. Um, How many are in the queue, just out of my curiosity? Yeah. Well, right now only a couple, and then after that, I will I will be uh, working on you know starting another project or another another go. Hopefully, it would come out and there'd be a lot more of them in my queue. But uh, right now, the big one is the review of the use of fonts. This is a uh, once I sort out the, some CSS layout, we, we could actually look at that if if we have a minute, you know. I'd, I'd love to hear what you think. So, yeah, you can read at it or, or I can summarize, but you know, it's pretty simple stuff. The fonts look too big. And there's another related issue that the links are not very clear colors. So we try and figure out. Um, hmm. um, yeah. I hadn't really noticed either of these things myself. And I go to the website a lot. Uh, it's going to look zoomed in now because I am zoomed in. At least I, oh, I guess I'm not. Yeah, look, Neith, you're not getting a scroll bar at the bottom of a horizontal scroll bar, which is very nice. But I am getting one, and I really don't like it. How yeah. far? I saw something weird happen on my, ooh, that's different. I was going to say I saw something weird happen on my mobile. Uh, I was on one of the docs pages. Oh yes, yes. And I don't know if it didn't load completely, but it just uh, showed up in like a ten pixel like left hand side of the page, and everything else was blank, like what you're describing, like a scroll bar at the bottom. But oh, okay. when I reloaded yeah, the page, it didn't look that way anymore. So I've, I've seen that before. Um, and when I reload the page, it goes away again. And um, I've seen that mostly when working in the web inspector on, on Google Chrome. So it might be an artifact from, from that too, I always thought. I've never seen it without, without yeah. the inspector. It just happened naturally on my phone. I think I opened the link and then copied it before the page loaded completely and navigated away. So maybe it was only partially oh, okay. loaded. Yeah, that, that, that's possible. And this was on the front page or, or another page? Uh, it was on, I think it was one of the customization docs pages. Okay. Um, someone was asking about uh, uh, scaling or something. Hmm. Don't remember. Yeah, might be a, a load issue. Some of the, the layouts being off on, on the front page is more common, just it's more complex layout. But. It was this page here. Okay, yeah. If you, if you see it again, you know, let me know. Okay. Yeah, hmm. so the font, the fonts, uh, they all the same font we're, we're thinking maybe would be nice to use like a, a serif font or maybe make the links underlined. Simple stuff, but maybe look a little nicer once I experiment a little bit. Do you know exactly where this stuff lives in the uh, um, content? What part of the stuff? Oh, the, like the, um, these guys here? Underscore index HTML. And then there, yes. I just wanted to see if there was an explanation for this thing here. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, go up now. We'll just find it. Guess, guess you can't do links this way in a block. Yeah, I think not. Uh, so it just should be like a link. Oops. I have a mess here.
Why not open a pull request? Oops. Oh, nice. And let's get a little screenshot in here. Perfect. I really appreciate the GitHub allows you to paste in the screenshots. Of there are some pretty nice features on here. Oh, I have to do my DCO. That's sign the commit while we're here. There. Okay, that's enough website stuff for now. Let's go back to yeah, flight stuff. Yeah, if you have font ideas, I want to hear them now or later. I look, I like the look of the website. I don't really have a very discerning eye. I think you've seen the way I dress, so. Well, you have your own style. Yeah, you have to probably have to ask someone else. Um, sure. So I have some ideas, but uh, not not developed yet. I hope this week, once I sort out some really basic but very frustrating CSS issues. Mm. All right, back to customize. So where are we? Helm releases. This is very old one here. Already, already old and not pretty stale. Let's see. Flux get Helm releases. Prince a release it was already deleted. Yeah, um, so hmm. this can happen if you get your Helm release stuck. Uh, and I think that there's more than one way that that can happen. Need a, I need a Helm release. I need an example. Let's look at this one. Is that not? Not found. Oh. Get tripping over my own aliases.
Yes, thank you. I was going to I was going to tell them how to do it with the patch because it's I always trip over this. It's a little bit awkward because it's an array. So you can't just wipe out all the array entries and set it to an empty string. Um, I don't know why that doesn't work, but you could set it to an empty array or you can set it to null and either one should solve the problem. Um, I don't know if I have a kubectl patch command in my here. One for Argo CD server. Must be a while ago. Okay, move on to the next one. I think that discussions are better for this meeting than issues and pull requests. Yeah, because those might require a lot more work to answer. I think I think we've uh, successfully filtered people into the discussions for the most part, and um, there's there's a page uh, contributing or something where we go into detail about the workflow for how you should uh, report issues. I don't think this is it. Maybe it's the community page. Oh, it's very hard to find the community page now. In the project? There it is. Support, that's what I'm looking for. We have this workflow page where we tell people uh, where they should put their thing depending on what it is that they're reporting. And we try to encourage people only to submit issues that are definitely bugs um, and not so much questions. And that is irritating to me. <laughs> Wonder how it got that way. Anyway, I think that discussions are just a lot lighter touch and it's probably a lot easier to work through them and actually close them productively. Is there any way to do integrate with a software supply chain? I don't know what that is. I assume it validates your images or something else somehow. Supply chain. It's like a logistic enterprise resource planning software. I don't, I think this is about supply chain security, like um, making sure that, I mean, I don't know how this would work here. Let's see. Software supply chain describe the same pages in my sample. All right. I don't really have an answer for this person. Um, I would probably think that it's something you do in a. Yeah, I mean, that's up to them to, to figure that out, I guess. Um, yeah, we'd like to be more helpful than that if we could. Uh, well, so what I'm what I'm going to suggest is uh, um, admission webhooks. It's a good thing to talk about. Kubernetes has this concept of dynamic admission controllers, and if you use Ingress Nginx on your Kubernetes cluster, this is a place where there is an example of a. Um, admission controller uh, where they do some really advanced validation stuff on your ingress, for example, uh, before they allow it into the cluster. So that's why it's called an admission 
uh, validating admission webhook. There are two types of admission webhooks that I'm aware of, at least. One is validating and the other is mutating. I've been reading about those, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so this will allow them to integrate with this other software. You would really like to validate the images before gets sent to the production cluster. Okay, well, we can mark it down anyway. I wanted to include answer discussions too, but it makes the list somewhat longer. Just because I don't, uh, I mean, I, I think you can tell from some of the ways that we're answering these questions that just because the question is answered doesn't necessarily mean the discussion is final. Uh, a little so, bit, yeah, not, like not really the same as like resurrecting an undead issue. Right. Let's see if there's any interesting ones that were already answered here. Multiple private keys in a SOP secret. I'm curious about that one. You can do it. So, multiple keys in the data section of the secret, each entry is the same private private key key. So, one of the historical things that would help to understand this issue for context is that in uh, the past we recommended the sealed secrets controller which works altogether different than the SOP secret support in uh, Flux V2 and customized controller. Okay. Um, sealed secrets controller has a single cluster secret that uh, sealed secret controller uses to decrypt all the secrets on the cluster. Okay. And uh, I don't remember exactly how it works, but I think if you have access to the cluster, you can um, extract a public key. So you can encrypt the secrets for the sealed secrets controller um, without you know, needing access to the private key. Sure. But um, what you can't really do is rotate the keys in a um, in a 
reasonable way where if some people are allowed to decrypt the data, then you know you can remove their key from the key ring and rotate the secrets. That's not possible in my understanding of sealed secrets. So SOPS does things differently. Um, I have some SOPS secrets here. Like here's the admin secret it has a password and username. So I think some other things are different also, like in a sealed secret, the entire data section is encrypted and the structure is opaque. Uh, but in a SOP secret, the individual data elements are encrypted. Um, and moreover, the key that is used to decrypt the data is mentioned here. So this is, if I were to go into my key ring, um, list secret keys, I would find that here. So that's a GPG secret that's in the cluster as a secret uh, SOPS GPG. Okay. So the SOPS GPG key is one identity. And if you know anything about PGP, you can encrypt a message to multiple identities. Okay. So what you could do is um, encrypt a secret. Uh, where is the SOPS? Let's see. Somewhere in here, there's supposed to be a. There we go. SOPS. So there's the same, this is just for reference of humans. Here's the entire public key. So you can import it into your key ring and do validation if you want. Uh, but here is the SOPS.yaml creation rules. So when you call the SOPS encryption tool, it knows what it should do. And I think that you, you can add multiple keys in the data section of the secret. I don't, it's not clear to me how to do that. Huh. So the idea is if you have three people on your team, you can encrypt the key to all of them, then they can all read the secret and see new values of the secret when it changes. And then when someone gets the X, you take their key out of the ring and re-encrypt the secret with a new rotated value. Um, so where you had in the previous, you know, in, in, in a secret definition, there was a reference to, to the to the key. Um, what would that data look like? Where's my at the bottom there? The fingerprint. Oh, that was it. That's the key. But that's an array, so can you just add another one? Uh, so here's the thing, you don't put this in here. When you start with a secret, it's just this part unencrypted. Okay, yeah, and then- And then the metadata is, is pretty much just that. Okay. And SOPS adds this whole section at the bottom when it does the encryption. So whatever you're gonna do, you have to do it in uh, this SOPS config file. Okay. Uh, and I would really like to know the answer to this. And we have probably just about enough time to find it in the SOPS documentation. Okay, so if you pull some in for the SOPS in there. Oh, just looks like that. Okay, just comma. Not so bad. No. And you, you just got to use a... What is that called? Blocks. I love it when they link to the thing. I had the same question. What is that? What does that even do? Block scaler. Okay. 
Okay, nice. Build a space separated list. Ah. So does that mean it really is an array? Block scalar style. I'm not sure what that means. Okay, so keep new lines or don't or um, replace new lines with spaces. Yeah, try select to keep new lines. Maybe I'll add one of one of these. So no, ah, no, I no. see. Yeah. This is great. This is the coolest tool ever. Okay, so here's what we're seeing here. There's keep new lines and there's replace new lines with spaces. No new line at the end. So I think that is what they did. This is what they did. And what is that going to give you? That's going to get you replace new lines with spaces. No new line at the end. Oh, okay. So it's, it's just a, it's just a string. Yeah. All right. Great. Just, all right. Well, well cool. So you just, you just give it a, give it a list, a list of fingerprints, and then that's going to encrypt it for all of them. Yeah, I'm just going to link this back to the discussion here. Right. All right, well, we're out of time. Just about out of time. Okay, this was valuable. I appreciate this. Yeah. The background on this stuff. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having the bug scrub. Cool. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, take care.